And I think a lot of times with subclinical diseases, the issue is we don't know if we're there until we look for them. So it's really important. Um, I hear a lot of producers say, oh, I, I don't have a problem with hypercutinemia. I don't have a problem with hypocalcemia, but we don't actually know until we go in and do some testing. Welcome to the Rumination Podcast presented by Jeffo Nutrition. I'm your host, Vicky Brieson. Today, we'll be discussing transition cow health and management with a focus on hypocalcemia and hyperketonemia. With me today to discuss this topic is Dr. Jessica McCart, research scientist. Dr. Jess McCart is an associate professor of ambulatory and production medicine at the Department of Population Medicine and Diagnostic Sciences at Cornell University's College of Veterinary Medicine. A diplomat in the American Board of Veterinary Practitioners, for dairy practice, Dr. McCart performs clinical service for, amb- for the Ambulatory and Production Medicine Clinic. She teaches veterinary students both in the classroom and on farms and conducts applied research. Her research program at the McCart Dairy Cow Lab focuses on the identification, epidemiology, and economics of periparturian metabolic diseases in dairy cows. Welcome to the show, Dr. McCart. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to speak with you today. So to start off, can you share with our audience what are the main diseases you observe in your practice and what the economic impacts of these diseases are? Sure. As a dairy veterinarian, I see all sorts of diseases and new ones every week, I feel like. But the main diseases I see are working on farms or with mastitis are early lactation diseases such as hypocalcemia, hyperketonemia, some also known as ketosis. We see a lot of retained placentas. We see cows with metritis. We see lame cows. So we kind of see a lot of everything, but really uh, most of those diseases happen in the early lactation period. And they are expensive diseases on an individual cow basis. Usually when we do lots of math, a few hundred dollars for each case. And the issue is we have, you know, a number of cows in each of these farms. And because they are common diseases, these individual animal costs really add up on the herd level and become quite expensive. What have you found to be the most effective management practices for preventing these periparturian diseases? And how can dairy farmers implement these practices in both a practical and cost-effective way? Yeah, there's so many things that we can do to help cows in early lactation. And I think it, it fundamentally it, it boils down to keeping them comfortable, keeping them happy, and getting them to eat as much of a well-balanced diet as possible. And so there are, you know, big changes that people can make. There are small changes that people can make to improve those. And I think for producers working with their herd management team, their veterinarian, their nutritionist, um, just getting together as a group and deciding what kind of changes to try in management wise, and then looking at the effect on fresh cow health and production can really help our producers improve that stage of lactation for our cows. Yeah, so you've mentioned small changes, big changes. Can you give a few examples of what some of these might look like? Sure. So, you know, big changes are things like building new dry cow barns to help reduce stocking density and increase bunk space. You know, those are quite expensive. Little changes can be things like how often in a week we are moving cows into an early lactation, or excuse me, into a pre-fresh pen how we manage cows through maternity. Do we move them there just in time for calving? Do we move them a few days before? And how much feed do we have available? How, you know, can we push up feed one more time a day and encourage our cows to eat more? So those are examples of small changes on that side. Thank you. You've talked about management practices to ensure that smoother transition period. Can you expand as well on the role of a proper nutrition program that supports those fresh cows' performance? Sure. And I'll start with that. I am I am not a nutritionist. I work with a lot of uh, wonderful nutritionists, and uh, they've taught me a lot along the way. And I think the important parts are in our 
our dry cows, it really starts there. So it's very easy sometimes to not worry about those cows, but those are the cows that we're setting up to be successful in early lactation. So I've really um, been sold on controlled energy diets in the prepartum period. So feeding cows a diet that allows their rumens to have good fill and good health, but not having them put on additional weight. And so this is a way that we can help cows really increase their dry matter intake after they calve, which then will reduce the amount of diseases they get after calving. There's a lot of possible diseases occurring during this period. And like you alluded to in the introduction, you certainly see all of them through your practice. A big part of your research, however, focuses on hypocalcemia and transition cows. In the process, you've come up with an interesting description of calcium dynamics. Can you explain how to best monitor and treat this disease? Sure. So first, I'll explain the idea of calcium dynamics. And this is a term we've developed as we look at the calcium concentration in the blood of cows through early lactation. So all of our dairy cows will experience a reduction in blood calcium after they calve because they begin production of colostrum and a lot of milk. And we've noticed that different cows have different blood calcium concentrations that may be high or low in the few days after calving. And so we can divide cows into basically four types of calcium dynamic groups. So we have cows that come into lactation and their blood calcium is relatively high the day after calving, and it maintains kind of a high level through four days in milk. And we term those as normal calcemic cows. They don't have a problem with hypocalcemia. They don't get sick, they eat well, they, they do great. We have cows that are transiently hypocalcemic. So their blood calcium drops at one day in milk, but increases rapidly by four days in milk. And these cows are really the highest producers in the herd. They don't get sick, they eat a lot, their reproductive outcomes are great. And so those cows have really managed this um, early lactation dynamics very well. And then our other two groups of cows are cows that are persistently hypocalcemic. So their calcium concentration in their blood drops at one day in milk, and it stays low through four days in milk. And those cows we found don't eat as, eat as much as the other two groups of cows. They suffer from increased risk of mastitis, metritis, ketosis, and they have worse reproductive outcomes. Then the fourth group of cows are ones that come into lactation with a relatively normal blood calcium concentration, but their blood calcium concentration does not really increase by day four. And we call those cows delayed hypocalcemic cows. And they are also at an increased risk of milk reduction long-term and they have more diseases. And so when we look at these calcium dynamics, we've seen that what's really important is that cows have increased their blood calcium by four days in milk. And so the best way to monitor for this currently is assessing the blood calcium status of cows around that four day in milk mark. And currently, because we don't have any really great cow side tests, we have to take those blood samples and send them off to the lab. But it's a good way we can monitor that on the herd level, kind of like we do with other diseases, for example, like hyperkinemia. Thank you. When talking about hypocalcemia, there also seems to be a growing interest over the last year about the phosphorus data status of the transition cows. Can you help us connect the points and remind us of the importance of phosphorus in the cows' calcium metabolism? How are they linked? What are the key considerations when we're looking at the phosphorus content of these cows' rations? Yeah, so phosphorus is a really important part of calcium metabolism. And Phosphorus is in generally important for cows. It does everything from, you know, phospholipid content. It helps cows with all sorts of enzyme processes, energy production, and it's a major part in bone, which we know calcium is also important regulator in. And so when we think of phosphorus dynamics in cows, when cows are hypophosphatemic, when their phosphorus concentrations are low, it also increases uh, parathyroid hormone production. And that does a lot of things, but parathyroid hormone production also affects calcium concentrations in the blood. And so as we learn more about, um, especially prepartum diets and phosphorus concentrations, we are looking, and I say we, not I, the dairy industry in general, are looking into how 
phosphorus dynamics might affect postpartum hypocalcemia concentrations. And the idea is that um, perhaps with some of these calcium binders that are fed prepartum or diets that are low in phosphorus, um, these binders or low phosphorus diets, in addition to reducing phosphorus, that will then increase um, potentially availability of calcium for that cow after she calves. Interesting. Thank you for sharing that with us. Now shifting gears to another disease that your lab focuses on, hyperketonemia. Can you remind our audience what causes it? And beyond that, what impacts it can have on the animal, including health, production, and even going as far as reproduction? Yeah, so hyperketonemia is um, a term we use for an excess elevation of ketone bodies in the blood. And, and that occurs in a lot of our early lactation cows as they go into this period of energy deficit where they cannot eat enough for the amount of energy they're using to make milk. And hyperketonemia itself is not a disease like, for example, ketosis, which has clinical signs associated with it. But cows that are hyperketonemic in that first week after lactation have very different outcomes for some of the things you mentioned than cows that may be hyperketonemic in the second week, where those cows are kind of ramping up to maximum milk production and those ketones are used for another form of energy. So cows that are hyperketonemic in the first week of lactation, we find that those cows have a much higher risk of all those other um, early lactation diseases. So metritis, displaced epimacem, they're more likely to be culled. And some of those are quite extensive. So we did a project once where we bled about 1,700 cows, and we found that every single cow that developed a displaced abomasin in the first 30 days in milk, they were hyperketonemic in the first six days of lactation. So a lot of these are pretty strongly associated. It's not a cause and effect, but there are things that are happening in that cow that are not normal. And so we see these cows that are hyperketonemic and early lactation, they produce less milk for the first few months postpartum. Again, they're at a higher risk for disease and that even goes into you know, reproductive outcomes. So they're less likely to become uh, pregnant to first service. And those outcomes usually as far as pregnancy kind of dilute out the further you get away from calving. Hyperketonemia can be monitored and that can be done through urine, milk, and blood samples. What impact does the sampling methods, including whether we're looking at BHB or NIFAS, and the timing of these sample collection have on our ability to properly predict and address this, not disease, but metabolic condition? Yeah, that's a great question and something that I think a lot of producers um, work with every day. So depending whether you're measuring urine, milk, or blood, you may be measuring different ketone bodies. So urine, we usually measure um, acetoacetic acid. In blood, we often measure beta-hydroxybutyric acid. And we can measure BHB in milk, but we can also estimate it in milk along with uh, milk acetone. And, um, you know, like any test, some tests are better than others. Um, blood BHB concentrations are really easy to diagnose cow side with a relatively inexpensive test, but you have to go get the blood, you have to lock up the cow. And so sometimes milk um, is the more preferred method. But currently the cow side milk tests um, are not as great as the handheld blood meters. Um, and the urine tests are somewhere in between, but as we know, Cows don't always urinate when you want them to, and uh, that's annoying in its own sense. And as far as the time of day, we've recently done some work looking at blood BHB concentrations and comparing them to milk BHB, milk, excuse me, predicted BHB concentrations or milk predicted blood NIFA. And there's actually a very large daily rhythm. We don't know if it's um, associated with eating, so a prandial, um, association or a diurnal association. But NIFA in the blood are normally highest right around feeding time, let's say once a day feeding in the morning, whereas blood BHB concentrations peak four to six hours after that first feeding because you get some BHB production um, of butyric acid across the ruminal epithelium. And so you see a big swing where depending what time of day you're testing cows for blood BHB, 
they're more likely to be hyperketonemic if you're testing them in that four to six hour range after a morning feeding. The cool thing in milk is that while there's some daily variation, it's way more consistent than with blood. And so some of these um, milk measuring techniques that people are starting to develop may help us get a better sense of the cow's actual um, energy deficit, I'll say, or um, BHB concentration status over the course of a day than taking it at a single time point via blood. Thank you for these practical details and really key pieces of information. It's important to always take those samples at the same time or at least know how timing of day and so on can affect our results. What are questions that you're still seeking to answer as it pertains to periparturian disease or uh, dairy cow metabolic status? Do you, how do you see the prevention and management of these diseases change in the future? Yeah, these are always exciting questions, and I feel like I could probably talk for a day about uh, things we're looking into. But in the McCart Dairy Cow Lab, we really focus on um, looking at diagnostics, so how can we better identify these cows? And currently, we're doing a lot of work with Dave Barbano, who's at Cornell University in the Food Science Department, looking at mid-infrared Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy and trying to assess um, different milk constituents and with the goal that maybe someday we'll have an inline system so we can look at cow health or deviation from cow health without having to touch them. Um, so that's exciting and really fun um, to think about as a developing technology. And then the other large area of research we have is, you know, what on the clinical side can we do from a treatment standpoint to um, either prevent some of these um, cows with, I'll say, dyscalcemia, so that have are hypocalcemic at day four, can we identify them ahead of time? Can we treat them ahead of time um, and help prevent uh, the negative aspects of that? So investigating different kinds of um, calcium therapies, uh, different you know prepartum nutritional strategies, all those sorts of things to see if we can kind of mitigate and how we can implement management changes that mitigate those downstream diseases. Thank you. To wrap it up, can you share your three take home messages for nutritionists, vet veterinarians and producers when thinking of practical transition cow management, especially when it comes to preventing and monitoring hypocalcemia and hyperketonemia? Sure. So I think the most important part first is having a good uh, management team to help and talk over some of these things. So, you know, the producer, the nutritionist, the veterinarian, whatever group of people you can get together to talk about what's happening on your specific farm. And I think a lot of times with subclinical diseases, the issue is we don't know if we're there until we look for them. So it's really important. Um, I hear a lot of producers say, oh, I, I don't have a problem with hyperketonemia. I don't have a problem with hypocalcemia, but we don't actually know until we go in and do some testing. And then we can see if there's A, a problem, and B, how big that problem might be, because we may be having negative economic effects. So I guess my first thing is have a group of people to, to talk with and brainstorm. My second is have routine monitoring be part of your normal herd evaluation, whether it's once a month, every two weeks, whatever your group decides on. And then the third one is to implement management changes or prevention strategies that are evidence-based and that you can assess. So don't just change something and not continue monitoring. So that's how we know if our changes are working. So find a group of people, monitor frequently, change things, and then go reevaluate how you're doing. Thank you, Dr. McCart, for being with us today. Thanks so much. This was great. I also want to thank our audience for being with us today. Don't forget to subscribe to Rumination on Spotify, Apple, Apple Podcast, YouTube, or other platforms. Feel free to visit jeffo.ca for more information. This podcast was brought to you by Jeffo Nutrition, precision nutrition for a growing world. Have a great day. <laughs>